Great. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, you had a, a good uh, lunch, and I'd like to let you know that um, uh, since uh, I last saw you, um, I've updated um, uh, two sets of resources. Um, I should get this on, uh, so we'll hear this. Um, so I hope you had a good lunch, and since I uh, last saw you, I've uploaded two sets of resources of relevance. Um, the first is um, uh, the videos from this morning. Um, those are on the YouTube site now. If anyone would like to make use of them, uh, you'd be welcome to do so. Um, please let us know if any uh, uh, quality issues. Those are the screencast videos. The ones from the uh, uh, this camera uh, have not yet been uh, been uploaded. Um, so uh, there, um, those will make it up in the fullness of time. Um, the, the second issue is that, um, uh, courtesy of Wade, I've uploaded a set of uh, case study uh, slides. Um, I'm going to be trying to, to systematically share the slides for all the presentations, but uh, Wade has beat me to the punch um, with three of his uh, case studies that he will be offering on various days of this event, including shortly, uh, later this afternoon. Um, for uh, one involving um, uh, waterborne uh, illness and distress um, uh, in Saskatchewan's north. So um, uh, those are up there and I'll be trying to upload further case studies uh, uh, as they occur as well as uh, slides from the presentations themselves. Um, so this morning, um, I hit on a set of um, high level points um, uh, involving the nature of dynamic modeling in general uh, and motivations for its use, as well as by extension its um, specifics when applied to agent-based and hybrid modeling. We will be spending um, much time on this boot camp discussing principles that apply across all system science dynamic modeling methods. Um, uh, but we will be spending particular time on methods involving agent-based and hybrid modeling. Um, the, uh, this morning's discussion tried to bring out principles such as uh, that of emergence, such as the value of um, uh, taking a theory of the world and putting it in an explicit form that can be shared, uh, collectively critiqued, and collectively refined um, as an important point. That's much of what modeling does. Um, modeling uh, also secures the advantage of having placed it in an explicit form that's precise, um, not merely explicit, but, but operationally precise we can also simulate it. And we can see the logical consequences of that theory and test them against comparable evidence bases from the world, or indeed motivate the collection of new evidence bases to challenge the model. And I pose this idea of models as learning tools, or to uh, quote the inimitable Jeff McDonald, learning prostheses, where far from being crystal balls, that you know are either predict uh, correct in their predictions or useless. Um, they are tools for learning more quickly, more deeply, and more reliably, and ultimately more thoroughly as well about the world around us. Um, and uh, I pointed out some ways in which they enable this. And one of the prime ways is by connecting our theorizing about the world with its logical implications in a way that we we can't connect the two um, unassisted. Um, it's through simulation that we can pose a certain theory of the world and see its logical implications over time, or indeed for agent-based modeling over space or over networks. And, and by so doing, by seeing the logical consequences, we can then compare those to, to um, evidence and understanding for the world, whether it's stakeholder experience, or whether it's quantitative time series or cross-sectional evidence. Um, 
that's indeed much of the motivation for using uh, dynamic modeling. And agent-based modeling offers us a particular degree of resolution in this enterprise. It allows us resolution at the level of an individual, but moreover, for reasons I alluded to when I was talking about aggregate system dynamics models, it allows us to transition from model outputs couched in terms of cross-sectional statistics over time to understanding of individual trajectories. And those trajectories are of great value in many contexts in terms of empirical reference um, with an ENTS at the end because they allow us to compare the outcomes of the models on the one hand, for example, with corresponding data um, collected at an individual level um, from the world in a way that cross-sectional modeling just doesn't, doesn't allow us the resolution to do so. It turns out that agent-based modeling also allows us to coach theories at a level of heterogeneous individuals uh, with, with great significance. So, um, we can, we can capture diversity amongst individuals more richly than we can with an aggregate model, even a stratified one. We can, uh, when we have these heterogeneous individuals, um, we, can, uh, we can base their decision making uh, or choices or risk behaviors or protective behaviors on their heterogeneous characteristics. So for example, um, their um, their uh, selection of, of uh, uh, one pathway of care versus another can be informed by their individual preferences as a patient, um, what they're seeking to achieve, or it can be based on their history of past adverse encounters with the healthcare system or supportive encounters. Um, it can be based on their location in space. They have a situated view of the world, perhaps, based on where they are located and they cap resources in accordance with their situated location. And this sort of rich representation of agent decision making and behavior is, is made possible by the finer granularity of agent-based models. We can also have interventions that are specific based on an individual's characteristics. Say their income level, or say their history, Perhaps we wish to treat in an STI clinic individuals who have presented for care three or more previous times differently than others, or according to their, um, their, risk, uh, you know, their risk profile. Um, we can do so and simulate interventions characterized based on an individual's history, or indeed an individual's uh, uh, heterogeneous characteristics in a rich way that it shapes uh, effective interventions that allows for evaluation of targeted interventions. It turns out that um, there's many other um, advantages to age-based modeling as well. Um, the ability to articulate these networks place people at certain spatial positions and reason, reason about their encounters with geographic or spatial, spatial resources. Um, we can by virtue of articulating things at an individual level, we can calibrate against empirical data that's longitudinal. We can compare model outcomes with, uh, with available data. We can parameterize certain things. And we can, uh, we can couch uh, interventions that are dependent upon it. Um, so this capacity to phrase models at an individual level affords us a level of characterization that's quite precise when it comes to many, uh, many factors in modeling, whether it's interventions or, or comparisons with empirical evidence. And that's important. We'll come back to that when we talk about trade-offs between methods. Um, but we also examined uh, with, uh, through this example model, um, some additional issues. We saw how it, how emergent data comes out of the model and how the patterns of that data can change, sometimes profoundly uh, based on uh, counterfactual interventions. Case in point being we put into place an intervention involving uh, much higher levels of vaccination in a disease which had been previously endemic, now 
um, uh, is, is largely um, uh, eradicated or is only very episodic. Um, we've changed the data generating process and that changes the patterns that we see uh, across the population. Um, and uh, it's a testimony to the power of dynamic modeling that we can examine these uh, counterfactuals, that we can use models in these ways that um, allow us to probe counterfactual regimes. Um, and it's one of the reasons why these sort of models uh, used in the right way with machine learning algorithms and, and big data tools can be so powerful, as I articulated not two weeks ago on this very campus. Um, excuse me, just over two weeks ago. Um, there's a few other features of the situation though I want to make sure that I communicate. Ladies and gentlemen, models of the sort that we've seen, the model that we worked with this morning, um, that model represented of necessity, and in fact as an asset, a simplification of the world. This is a, a gross simplification of the world. Some might argue an impoverishment uh, of, of descriptive richness of the world. But models are not meant to, and in fact are abused if they try to be used as a perfect description of the world. And there is no shortage of modeling projects out there, some of which have been led by esteemed modelers who would have sought quite fruitlessly to build comprehensive models of some broad area, you know, a model of the immune system, for example, as a whole. Um, model of the cell as a, as a whole. Modeling is, is best and most effectively used in the ways that maps are most effectively used. Models like maps are abstractions of the world. They, they simplify and they, they achieve a mimicking of the world that leaves out a great amount of detail. And by so doing, they allow us to reason about the world, uh, about factors we may see in the world, with greater clarity. Because they allow us, for example, to test to what degree the patterns of the world might be explained by a very simple hypothesis involving um, uh, a small number of, of different interacting um, uh, and processes with certain characteristics. Models like maps um, achieve their value because of their simplicity. Uh, just as um, if we want to have a map of the city to drive from you know, the airport uh, to this very uh, building, um, we would seek a map that abstracts away from tremendous detail, leaves out all sorts of detail about you know walking paths and where there are sidewalks and not and the sewer location of sewer drains or electrical towers, et cetera, and, and cuts down to the essence of the road connectivity. Um, uh, so it is that we achieve value with models by leaving out detail because it allows us to think through with greater clarity how just a, a certain number of factors interact to produce or not patterns comparable to what we see in the population. To what we see in the in the empirical evidence. Models like maps, though, are purpose specific. We don't always build the same model of you know, food seeking behavior. The model goal shapes what's in the model properly spent. And um, just like with a map, right? If you want to understand why brownouts, electrical brownouts are occurring in certain areas of, of Saskatoon, or if you want to see why flooding is occurring. Those features, like location of sewer grates or of electrical towers, might be of tremendous relevance. So you need them in your map. Um, if you wanted to understand uh, features of that flow of water, you might want a topographic map. Whereas for your purposes, it might be fine to assume that Saskatoon, living up to its reputation, is flat as a pancake. Maybe it's more so. Um, actually, the river valley is not. That's a it. Um, so the point is, models like maps are specific to purpose. And one of the things we'll talk about a lot tomorrow morning, when your stomachs are not quite as full, 
in the afternoon drowsiness is not setting in. We will we'll talk about this issue of model purpose and model scoping and how we scope a model, how we use model purpose as a logical knife to cut away unnecessary detail, or detail we have reason to believe right now is unnecessary, and how we learn from that model over time where that boundary needs to be most effectively. But um, models here are simplifications of the world. They achieve value because they are simplifications, like a map we can fit in our car because it's a simplification here. We can reasonably execute it and understand it because it's a simplification. Um, but over time, we re-examine just how simple it can be. And much of the reason that I advocate hybrid modeling is because it allows us over time to change as our understanding evolves about what needs to be captured and what not, what needs to be captured in greater detail and lesser detail because it's not so sensitive to that, we can change what methods we use to depict different areas of okay. So uh, we'll be seeing that. So those were some additional comments um, from uh, this morning. Um, we are dealing here with characterizing systems that are complex, that exhibit um, nonlinearity, that exhibit blowback, that exhibit a situation where they're of something different than some of the parts, and we build models that that are up to describing those characteristics. And we do so in a way that uses causal posits, causal mechanisms, so that they can address uh, counterfactuals um, uh, more effectively and, and, and answer counterfactual regime questions. So those are some important features, um, messages from this morning. We saw three traditions in which we can articulate these models. System dynamics modeling, agent based modeling, and uh, discrete event simulation. Um, each of them is rich, each of them is powerful, none of them is a replacement for the others. Um, each has its own sphere of natural, rich application. And you will see them featured prominently in a number of hybrid models um, wh which play to those strengths. Uh, in incoming in uh, sessions of this boot camp. You saw it as early as this one, where we had a model associated with uh, some continuous characterization of weight change. Stylized as that was, we have models that have far richer characterization of weight change. Um, but with mixing in also elements of, um, of age-based modeling in the form of uh, state charts. Okay? Um, and in general, we will uh, mix them together, um, and we will talk about some of the upsides and some of the um, uh, shortcomings of, uh, of mixing them together in ways you can work around some of those shortcomings. Okay, those are some comments from this morning. I, I outlined a certain perspective that will carry us through the week, and we were introduced to a tool that, while not privileged, will carry us through the week. Are there any questions about that that I can answer before we go on to a little bit more introduction to the tool to empower you to explore these models where we're going to dive into some hybrid models after that? Any questions I could answer? Discussions I could have? Going? Going? Go on. Well, it's never going. Just interrupt, interrupt me any time. Okay, so that was my retrospective, um, and 